it's my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Uh, so we're joined by Dr. Maurice Nuko, who is joining us from Brazzaville in Congo. Um, and as you can see, will talk to us um, this morning about relevance of atomic force microscopy to Africa from nanobio devices to biomass conversion in bioenergy. So Dr. Nuko obtained a maitrise in physics in 2009 from the Faculty of Science and Techniques of the University Marianne Nugabi in Congo, Brazzaville. And in 2010, she was selected for the postgraduate diploma program in condensed matter at the International Center for Theoretical Physics in Trieste, Italy. Then in 2011, she obtained funding to grant for a thesis funded by the European Research Council, thesis which she defended in 2015 at the Department of Physics under the option of nanotechnology and nanoscience at the University of Trieste in Italy. After a year of postdoctoral work in Italy, she decided to return to Congo to share her knowledge. And currently, she's a lecturer in physics at the Faculty of Science and, and, and Techniques of the University Maria Nugabi and a junior researcher associated with ICTP in Italy, in charge, also in charge of uh, the laboratory uh, research unit in nanomaterials and nanotechnologies. Um, Dr. Nuko has received um, several national and international awards and is in charge of two funding research projects. Um, so I'm sure it'll be a very excited talk at the cross between, um, well, everything you can do using a physical technique to study real biological um, uh, systems. So without further ado, uh, Maurice, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sorry, just one. Okay. So hello, everybody. Um, thank you for giving me such opportunity. I'm uh, Marie Zikwa from Congo Brazzaville. I will be talking about the multi application of nanotechnology tools called the atomic force microscopy, said AFM. So uh, let me see. Oops, okay. So currently, I'm a, um, a researcher, as Petro say, I'm a lecturer in the Department of Physics at the university, and I'm a researcher in a nat public national institute in where we mostly do theoretical work, and some of them also are experimental work. Okay, so. Today, uh, it's well known that advanced nanotechnology allow the, um, the manipulation of molecules with nanoscale precision. And uh, it can be used for the production and characterization of sensitive devices. The talk will be divided into two parts, as you could see from the slide. Um, on the first part, I will say the application of this uh, nanotechnology tool, uh, the AFM, on the nano device, nano bio devices sector and the application on the bioenergy sector. And the, the goal is to, to show how the IFN could be used as a powerful tool or as a powerful without technique. So just a brief introduction about the IFM, uh, how it works. So it's, it's quite a simple instrument, right? So it measures the force interaction between uh, a nanometer size tip, as you could see here, and a cantilever here. So the, the, the IFM measures the interaction between the tip and the sample. And the, the, the benefits of working with the IFM that you could work in the liquid, in the hair, or in any kind of environment. So you could also mean you could work in physiological environment. So just to say briefly, um, so you have uh, this uh, nanometer size tip, which is mounted on the cantilever bit, and at any surface in any environment, it's allowed to measure the surface with high resolution and accuracy. So when the tip interacts with the, the surface or the sample, uh, the cantilever change its dynamic or static property in response to the sensed force by providing a 3D topographic profile to the surface. So most of the AFM, of course, is uh, made of this probe here, which follow the surface, a detector here, and a piezo uh, actuator, a piezoelectric, which control the deplacement or the movement of the surface. 
So when you are working with VIFM, you have many modes of operation. You could work in what they call contact mode or intermittent mode or non-contact mode. What does it mean, in fact? The interaction force sensed by the cantilever, uh, by the cantilever, depends on the tip sample distance. So during the scanning, the cantilever can operate in the static or dynamic force mode. And then what's happening, for example, in the contact mode? So you have your cantilever here, which is directly in contact with the surface. And so while the cantilever is scanning the surface, it's recording all the topographic surface happening on the surface. And here you are in the region they call the repulsing force. You could also work in the tapping mode. What is happening here is that your, your cantilever is not directly in contact with the surface, but it's like it's oscillating at a resonance frequency. And um, like the tapping one and the non-contact mode, you are like in the attracting force. So you will say, okay, in which each mode you could, you need to choose which kind of sample you are going to, to work on it. For example, if you would like to do some um, study on cell or I don't know, bio, bio stuff in the sense because they are softer, it's of course most relevant to work in non-contact mode because you don't want to damage your surface, right? So if the mode of operation, it depends on the type of experiment you are going to implement, just simply say. So as I said before, you could use the AFM just to do some measurement with biological process. You could also do use the AFM to do some Nano fabrication. So we will go deeper later, later on on this matter. Okay. So here I'm reporting a um, few images which are quite important because, for example, on this uh, uh, left side you have contact mode image of uh, human red blood cell. So this is at a nanoscale, so you could clearly see like how the configuration of red blood cells are happening. On the right side, you have, um, it represents the image of red blood cell infected by malaria parasite, infected by malaria parasite fasciparum. And if you lose, like you look at the close up of the image right here, you could see on the surface of the cell, you have something they call knobs. The knobs are made of protein, and this uh, protein interact with healthy cell, which cause the propagation of the, the disease when uh, you are infected with the parasite malaria. So just to summarize what you could do when you are doing the imaging working with the AFM, you could clearly see how the cell are infected, and you could clearly differentiate between healthy and uh, infected uh, cell. Like in this case, they are infected by the malaria parasite. Something else you could do also with the IFM is that you could manipulate molecule on the surface. Um, as for example, this is for your tip, and this is the same here. So what you could do uh, to manipulate biomolecule on the surface, um, one of the methods used is called what they call deep pen lithography. It's by using, uh, uh, it was created by Merkin in 1990. What I would like to emphasize here is that the possibility of chemically coating your IFM tip with biomolecule on, on your IFM tip and proceed with any kind of manipulation of surface. So if you would like, for example, to immobilize some antibody or some polymer or some polyelectrolyte or self-assembling ligon protein, whatever you would like to do, you could functionalize your tip, chemi chemically functionalize your tip in order to immobilize your, whatever you would like to immobilize on surface in order to investigate on it. So, uh, here it's uh, really like a really nice example on the interaction or, or um, study of uh, the tip which are functionalized. 
with, uh, as you could remember, this image I just showed you, it was uh, infected red blood cell when you have those knobs. Those knobs are here, you could see. And here is the example how this knob interact with healthy red blood cell. When they interact, they, 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 they are the cause of the propagation of the disease inside the, the, the body. So in this paper, for example, they have studied the interaction between the ligand and the uh, antibody in order to see their bending interaction. And this is such kind of work which are implemented in order to move forward in the sense of uh, finding a, a vaccine in order to find the breaking point between the ligand and uh, the receptor. So these are really interesting work of really, uh, which are currently, for sure the paper is called, but the people are still working on it in order to find how to, to, to break this uh, ligand and uh, receptor interaction. So on the part about the nanofabrication, and this is what I I mostly work. Uh, of course, I still do the imaging, but I mostly work on the part of the nanofabrication. And when I'm talking about nanofabrication, is that the goal is to see, especially for one, what I, I, I mostly uh, specialize is to try to enhance uh, the feed of DNA nanoarray because those feed are devices which are made in order to detect uh, some DNA, macroRNA or protein in order to have um, uh, a solution for some or solution or therapy uh, problem, let's say. So when you work in the field of DNA nano devices, most of the detection is happening through a process of called hybridization. The hybridization is a process uh, happening between a probe of DNA and in solution you have a target. So the target is what you would like to detect on solution, right? So at the first step, you have a immobilized DNA on surface. Then you proceed with uh, incubating your solution with uh, a target uh, probe. And then you follow with the hybridization. For sure, there are many kind of, uh, you know, there is different readout technique. There are the optical detection approach, the electrochemical detection approach, the mass sensitive detection approach, the nanomechanical detection approach. All of them are quite great, but if you have to say the truth, some of them are quite complicated when you would like to detect anything on surface. For instance, when you are using the optical detection approach in order to detect your hybridization, you, you measure, in fact, the what happening, your probe is labeled. So you have already fluorescence happening over there. And you measure the quenching happening with the hybridization with a label probe and a target you would like to do. You would like to, to, to see if uh, the hybridization has happened. The other detection approach is the electrochemical approach. This is also good. it's uh, it's uh, efficient, but uh, so what happening that you measure through the difference of capacitance at the electrode and electrolyte surface. You have also the mass sensitive detection approach. Here, in fact, the image is small, but you have some cantilever which are put in the standing up direction. And on the top, you have some probe on surface of the cantilever, and then you proceed with the hybridization uh, with the, the, the hybridization on surface. So you will ask me how do, are you proceeding with the hybridization simply by detecting the deflection of the cantilever before and after hybridization. And finally, you have the nanomechanical detection, which is the one um, I'm based on in which you measure the variation of height before and after hybridization using the IFM. Sorry. So in case uh, you, when you would like to use uh, this nanomechanical uh, detection approach, we combine the IFM with the lithography technique called uh, nanografting. And the nanografting is like the deep pen lithographing I just showed before, when you have the, 
functionalized, the tip is functionalized with biomolecular surface. But in this case, it's different. So you don't functionalize your tip with anything, uh, uh, anything. But it's, um, it's a reverse process. You start typically with a surface, like here in this case, you start with uh, a surface made of gold in which you immobilize some self self-assembly monolayer of alkyl molecule. You, you, we choose thiol molecule because they have high bonding affinity with gold. So what happening in the solution? So this is uh, the, IFM, the, the process of, um, of, so you, this is the, your IFM tip, I just represented here. And this is your surface, right? So with your IFM tip, you apply high forces. So you could control the, 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 the kind of force you will be applying on the back of your cantilever. So you apply high forces, but knowing already in solution, you have some target you would like to immobilize on surface, okay? So this is like a carpet reference here. And in solution, you have some molecule in, you, in which you would like to immobilize on surface. So you apply high forces those on your IFM tip. The, the, the tip will displace locally molecule on surface, okay? Because you apply high forces. And then the thiolytic molecule in solution will be replaced by the alkyl molecule in solution, okay? And then you apply again low forces on your IFM tip, which, because now you would like to do some imaging of what you did replace on surface. And then you record directly your IFM height. So for example, in this case, we did immobilize what you call some, uh, some DNA on surface. So this is like DNA on surface, and this is some alkyl molecule on solution, in solution, okay? You could also do the reverse process because in this case, for, for instance, this is the, the, DNA, the, the DNA we, we immobilize on surface is higher compared to the, the reference carpet. This is why the high, the, the, the high of the DNA is higher compared to the, to the carpet. But you could choose also some thiolytic DNA which are low, uh, really short, like 20, 20 nucleotide in length. And mean, it means that the carpet will be higher compared to the DNA in solution. So here, as you see, you have your thyroid DNA, and here you have the height to measure and you would like to measure. So having this tool, it's, it was really useful for us in order to, 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 um, to create our nano device on surface because we could, know, we could use it to control many things, but we could also control the kind of molecule you would, in which we would like to immobilize on surface. For example, here you could change the density of molecule you would like to immobilize. Here, for example, you see you have low density, like here you have medium density, and here you have high density of molecule you did immobilize on surface. In order to play with it, you play with, um, the concentration of molecule you, uh, you would like to immobilize. You play also with the kind of the number of time the tip is passing and uh, back and forward uh, on surface. You could play with those two parameters in order to have different density of molecule immobilized on surface. So using the density control, using the nanografting, we use it in order to detect any key, anything we would like to, to see or to, to target on the solution. You would tell me, okay, how are you able to detect between like a single strand DNA and a double strand DNA? Simply because the single strand DNA is more flexible than the double strand DNA. So when you have a single strand DNA, you measure, so you use your nanografting process, and then you proceed with the, the, the measurement of height the height of your, your, of your nano assembly monolayer. So here the height of course is lower. And then you proceed with the incubation with your target DNA. You measure the height. And then of course the height is higher. Why? Because the single strand is more rigid, uh, uh, flexible compared to double strand DNA. So it's more flexible 
compared to the double strand DNA, which is rigid, so the height is more, um, the double strand DNA behave like a flexi rod, so it's really rigid compared to the single strand DNA. So using all of those uh, uh, parameters, we, we, we did work a lot on statistical and mechanical property in order to understand how to improve our nano devices, how to, to, to have an efficient nano devices in order to detect any kind of prop or any kind of target, especially uh, in the, in the bioclinical bio sector. So, but we combine in most of our work, we combine not only the IFN measurement, but we combine it also with the molecular dynamic simulation approach, so a theoretical approach. So this is uh, what I just showed, told you for the optimization of those nano devices. We did a lot of work on combining uh, IFM, so experimental work with theoretical work. We did a lot on, on try to understand which are the parameters to have a better efficiency of, uh, of our nano devices. And we did some, um, a lot of computation approach in order to, have, to see what is happening on the, 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 the strength when it immobilized on the surface. Just to start with the first one on the combination between the IFM measurement and the molecular dynamic simulation. Uh, so, Alexander Piet uh, Bosco was the, the, the first one in order to try to understand what was happening to those nano devices, uh, what was affecting the density, the capacity of the efficiency of the hybridization. And uh, in his paper, what he did, he, he worked with the IFM compressibility measurement of the IFM tip over carefully cross-trained molecular dynamic simulation. And he estimates the surface density of the molecule. Here you see from the single strand DNA and double strand DNA. And he found that, uh, he demonstrated that even at high density, nanopartin could hybridize just up to 30 percent so this is what he found that what he when he combined is uh, molecular dynamic simulation a cross grain approach and the compressibility ifm density he found that the the simulation found that the, the, the efficiency of hybridization was only up to 30 percent so this was for me a benchmark in order to clearly understand what was the limit of hybridization, what was, uh, uh, what were the parameters which were leading to have this kind of limitation. In this context, um, what we did, we use, of course, the, the combination of atomic computer simulation, including explicit solvent molecule, because Alexander Bosco, he didn't take into account of all the explicit solvent molecule inside this, our study. And uh, we're combining uh, with of, uh, IFM molecule, nanolithographic approach. So as now, I hope you people understand when you have the IFM, you do the grafting. When I do, I say grafting, it's uh, using the nanografting technique. So the lithography technique in order to immobilize your DNA on surface. So here you have the carpet, the, the, the DNA on surface, and here you have the reference carpet. So in order to have your height, this is your height of your DNA, okay? So we did the measurement in different uh, salt concentration. Here you see 200 and 400 millimolar, and we implement the hybridization. We implement the hybridization. Of course, now also you people know when you do the hybridization, you have a difference of height before and after because single strand DNA is more flexible than double strand DNA. On the same side, from the MD simulation, we also did some box of the same process we did with the simulation in order to have an independent work. So from the MD simulation and the, the IFM measurement. So what we, we, 
were able to find is that, as you could see from this hybridization fork, so we have like a, um, a equilibrium at this between 22 and 20 and 44 percent, and we found that uh, we have proved that the hybridization is intrinsically limited by the uh, molecular uh, and electrostatic crowding independently. So what is happening that when you 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 could not uh, go a threshold of this space because you have this limitation of hybridization. So the, 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 the nano assembling monolayer of DNA is already packed. So when you add again a target inside the nano assembling, it's already crowding. So the hybridization could not occur anymore. So you reach like a limitation of your, of your, your, your system. So it's simply due to the crowding happening inside the system. So we didn't stop here because as you could see, we observed that, sorry, we did observe that when we were hybridizing uh, at different uh, salt concentration, you see the height was behaving differently in presence of different salt. So we say, okay, let's go deeper to this in order to understand how we could um, uh, understand better what is happening between the strand be before the hybridization. Because you know that DNA is negatively charged, right? So when you had uh, some counter ion, it will differently affect the conformation of your DNA strand. So what we did, as I told you, we, we have control on the density of molecule we would like to immobilize on surface. We have control also on the, on the on, on, the, on the nanografting. So what we did, we graphed at different density our, our DNA on surface. We changed the salt concentration, as you could see here. We, um, uh, we did the imaging in one molar, 0.1 molar, 0, 0 0.1 molar, and so on. Because we wanted to understand but what is happening at those different uh, states when we are uh, implementing uh, before the hybridization. And maybe it has an impact on the efficiency of the hybridization. So we measure the height of uh, at those different points at high density monolayer, medium and low. And what we found that, as you could see, when you have a higher salt concentration, your DNA is packed like mushroom-like configuration. And this is simply due to the fact that all the counter ions screen the electrostatic charge carried by the DNA. So this is why your high is lower when you have high salt concentration. Instead, when you have low salt concentration, you have, a, of course, the reverse process. So your height is higher because your DNA is behaving like a, a flexing rod. So it's free to stretch because you, have, you don't have enough counter ion. So we needed to understand how we could uh, try to uh, fit all those parameters with uh, some um, uh, polyelectrolyte modeling. So we use the, the, the theory of polyelectrolyte theory, which uh, behave as a function of the density and the salt concentration. And of course, when you will go to the literature, you will find many uh, parameters in order to, to interpret or to try to investigate those kind of theory happening. So we, we say, okay, we need to choose which kind of, which parameter are we going to use or which exponent are we going to use in order to fit our data. So what we did, we put our data in the log loss scale, and then simply we extract the exponent, which was um, around minus one and six, which is uh, in agreement with um, the paper of Ari Allen, which were quite similar work also. So we use our model in order to extract uh, some uh, parameter like the Internucleotide distance. So the internucleotide distance is the distance between the two nucleotides. We wanted to see how the, this distance behave as a function of the salt concentration. 
So we do the, we did an approximation of the theory, as you could see here. We replace the, the, the contour length because here we choose long uh, DNA, which were around um, 44 bases. We use the density, as I told you, we know the density. Uh, we, we could estimate the density of molecule immobilized on surface. And then uh, we implement the fitting in order to extract the, 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 the internucleotide distance, which is, uh, was uh, quite good because in the literature, people use most of the, the, the study use in order to, to extract the internucleotide distance. They use um, uh, X-ray uh, technique, but with this simple method, we were able to extract the the internal creator distance and value which are quite consistent with what we found in the literature. Because we wanted to see maybe also, uh, we wanted to check how those nano assembly behave as a function of different kind of, of salt. Because we say, okay, we are, you, we are observing this kind of uh, work just with one kind of salt. We are implementing the study, changing the type of salt. We observe the same kind of behavior. So it means that while you increase the salt concentration, the height decrease, and uh, decreasing the salt concentration, your height full stretch. So the height was quite almost the same. Simply here, we found a different behavior in the sense that when you have monovalent ion, as you could see here, the height is higher because it's monovalent. So uh, it's uh, screen less your DNA backbone compared to divalent height, which are quite big, and they screen more your DNA backbone. And this is why your height is lower compared to um, compared to to uh, to monovalent iron. Okay, and then. People could say also, oh, why are you finding some difference between uh, monovalent ion? Simply because uh, you have the difference of uh, ionic radius because uh, this one is higher. So when it's hydrated, it's be, no, this one is higher. When it's hydrated, it becomes bigger. So this is why the difference is uh, like that. And the same from here, you just take into account of the difference of ionic radius. So when it's hydrated, it's be, be, the, the, the magnesium chloride behave bigger and uh, has the tendency of screening more your, your single strand DNA compared to uh, calcium chloride. So having this, we use the same procedure. We use the same approximation of, uh, of uh, our theory. And then uh, we extract the, the parameter as you could see here as a function of salt concentration, as you could see. And this has really let us know that when you are playing with the salt concentration, the type of salt will differently screen your, your, your DNA and making clearly impacting differently the efficiency of the hybridization. So using all this knowledge of optimization of nano devices, we wanted to move toward a real case study. So now, because we know which is the best salt to use, which is the density to use, uh, now we needed to go to a real case study. And for that, we use, uh, we apply all our knowledge to the detection of uh, what they call microRNA and also on the single base mismatch detection. So what is macroRNA? Uh, MacroRNA are small non-coding RNA molecules. They are around 20 to 23 nucleotide in length, so they are really short. Huh? And they are involved in um, almost all cellular function and they regulate gene expression by binding to the target messenger RNA, as you could see here, okay? So the dysregulation of macroRNA can negatively impact normal or um, uh, normal gene expression and play a role in the initiation, progression, and maintenance of human disease, such as cancer or cardiovascular disease. So they really play a role on uh, on enhancing the disease in our body. So 
many work are implementing in order to detect them at uh, at the early stage and so on. But they are quite difficult because they are um, easily degradable. So while working with macroRNA, you need really great tech, great care in order to have a, a good efficient detection. So as I say here, why study macroRNA? Because they, are, they have been found to, to, to be related to cancer, to cardiovascular disease and many other. So they are clearly a great candidate to be used as a clinical biomarker. So you will tell me why uh, the interest on this macro and then, yeah, there are already conventional techniques which are working on it. They are detecting uh, like um, uh, the, the PCR and so on. But the disadvantage, disadvantage of those techniques is the amplification, so the enzymatic reaction, and it could be a little bit quite uh, cost and time consuming. So our idea was to overcome those issues. So we work in collaboration with uh, um, a clinical lab uh, in Milan in order to provide us some macroRNA. We wanted to test all we did in order to see if our de device were quite optimum. So they provide us some different type of macroRNA. They provide us some macroRNA which were uh, regulated in hair failure. So they found some which were really upregulated in hair failure and some downregulated. And as a control, they gave us some so some macroRNA in mouse. So what we did as a control, we say, okay, we grafted the different density of macroRNA, yeah, uh, of single strand gene, because as you know, for us, the detection is um, by, uh, by implementing the hybridization between a single strand DNA and a target. So here, the target is the macroRNA. So we implemented the hybridization of uh, three different sequences of uh, single strand DNA. As you could see here, we measure the height, as you could see here. Then we implement like um, blind, blindly the hybridization with uh, one sequence of macroRNA. We, after the hybridization, so after the incubation, we observed that one sequence as this one just uh, didn't move uh, almost, I could see here, even in the imaging, it didn't change at all. And this one, as you could see, has a height increase because it's, it's making us, giving us information that the hybridization has happened here, okay? And then we implement a second hybridization. This is like a control one, as you remember, the camp called macroRNA. So here we saw a little bit of change of uh, height, but here it's still uh, at the same value here also. And then we implement the third hybridization. And then we found that, okay, these uh, were quite uh, good and we were quite happy because the last paper showing the, the, the capability of detecting this microRNA were around 10 picomolar, and thus we were able to go lower than this uh, without any amplification approach, without any, um, it's a cost-free technique in order to have this, detect, this nano devising, being able to detect uh, uh, such kind of complicated targets. So, we were sure also about the selectivity of our nano device. As you could see, the, 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 the hybridization was occurring specifically where uh, the, the, the probe were. So this, of course, was like a control test in order to, before to go to the real uh, case print. So then we asked our collaborator to give us a directly sample coming from plasma. Uh, from blood. So what we did, we grafted the gas, so a control, a regulated, and so on. And then we proceed with the incubation with the macroRNA extracted from plasma sample. So what we observe with the height, the first one, which is like the control, so coming from mouse, 
before and after I'm, uh, hybridization, excuse me, we didn't see that much height change as you could see here. So it say, okay, it's more almost, uh, it didn't change. This is normal because we are working with blood, human blood. So we should not see any change of height because uh, this is like the one of the mouse. And then we implement the, the second incubation with um, this one of, uh, uh, of uh, the upper related. We saw, uh, I would say, a few changes. So this could be also, when you do the measurement with the IFM, you could have uh, compressed a little bit, but at least we saw a slight change of height. And this told us something was happening here. And then we implement the last hybridization. And here clearly you could see how the upregulated macroRNA was detectable. So it means that the nano devices, which are quite cheap, were able to detect the kind of macroRNA coming from human uh, uh, samples. So those results, uh, although they are still, still semi-quantitative, give us really a re reliable information on the expression of macroRNA. And uh, it was give, it gives us really hope to be using it for uh, a clinical uh, advanced study. And uh, we were quite happy to have uh, such kind of information. Okay. So since we were quite confident about our device, then we have challenged our IFM-based nan uh, nanomechanical approach to distinguish single base mismatch, okay? Um, because and uh, the one we were we wanted to detect was the TG uh, mismatch of DNA sequence because they are in fact responsible for most of the common mutation uh, leading to the formation of tumor and uh, they rise from error in replication uh, uh, process. So they are quite important in order to detect such kind of uh, single base mismatch. So we use always the same process of uh, of we of our nano devices, but to, to evaluate the specificity of our devices toward the fully and non fully um, uh, mismatch sequences, what we did we grafted the two sequences of DNA of single strand DNA here. We record the height as you could see here. We implement the hybridization with one sequence. Okay. As you could see, after the hybridization, the two sequences hybridize, okay? Because the difference are just of one, of one. It's, the difference is just of one, is, and that is, so it's normal that they hybridize. And then, so this is uh, the, the first one, the first batch of single strand. The second one is this one. And we implement the hybridization. So you could see the difference between before and after hybridization. Because the difference is just of one, uh, uh, one uh, of the T and the G. And then we pr proceed with the thermal eating because we know that with the thermal eating, when, but we didn't use any kind of melting temperature. We use the melting temperature of the TG in order to be able to break the unspecific binding, okay? So we implement the hybrid, the, the thermal eating, and what we observe after thermal eating, the strength go back to the initial value, the one which were mismatchly bind, the one, this one, it go back to its initial value. And instead, the one which are fully bind stay quite uh, 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 um, stable. And this was also, uh, we published it, I think one year ago, uh, or no, one year ago. And uh, we were quite happy because this also, it avoid all the conventional technique in order to detect any kind of base mismatch. And it's good because people in the clinical work, they use it in order to see if like their sample are, um, are mismatch, or where they are mismatch, and so on. Okay, 
So for the last part of the talk, uh, um, since uh, we, of course, we do, we did a lot of work about the the application of uh, the IFM on the nano bio devices, but now we also have a, a, a unique working in bioenergy, so it's a little bit different now. But I will just give you a slide of, of what we do with that also. So what we were thinking is that, you know, nanotechnology now is used in order to enhance many things in the sector of, of biofuel or bioenergy, right? So we say, okay, how the IFM could help us to enhance the production of biofuel. Because in our laboratory, we master the production of biofuel like uh, bio oil, biochar, biogas, and so on. But what we have found special specifically for the bio oil. So just it, the, the, to, to say simply, when we produce the bio oil, we produce it with uh, biomass coming from uh, specific alga because it, specifically in Congo, we have a problem of algal bloom. So in order to overcome those issue, we have uh, created a disposit, uh, design in order to uh, proceed by the synthesis of uh, bio, bio uh, oil. But what we have found that our bio oil was not that much efficient. It was not that uh, good quality. So we made a step back in order to understand well before the production of uh, this bio oil, how we could produce a great and uh, cheap bio oil with, uh, which we could be used uh, anywhere. So we understand that those uh, biomass are made, as you could see here, those biomass are made of what they call the linen. So they are made of many fiber. And those fiber, when they are not treated, so when you produce directly with the carbonization of those biomass, you find a bio oil, as in our case, which are quite, uh, if I could say in simple English, which are dirty, which are not clean. But instead, uh, when you proceed with the treatment of this bio oil, you have a cleaner bio oil and help you to have a more efficient uh, 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 biofuel, let's say. So we, doing the, the, the step back, we say, okay, we will uh, use the same biomass uh, as you could see here. We will synthesize what they call some nanoparticle of, uh, of um, uh, of uh, our biomass. So it's quite simple process. You have some plant extract, use, use some uh, zinc oxide nanoparticle, and then you, you, you proceed with the, the biosynthesis. And then you do some UV spectrometer in order to see the peak of absorption. You don't stop here. Then this is where the IFM come in place because the IFM help us to see the size of the, our nanoparticle synthesizing, because you don't want to use for the treatment or for the cleaning of your biofuel, you don't want to use any kind of uh, of um, you don't want to use any kind of uh, nanoparticle. You need to use specific nanoparticle which have specific size and which have specific property. So in order to see that, we of course, for example, in Congo, we don't have all the equipment, but the IFM help us to distinguish which type of, uh, of nanoparticle are good to be used for the, uh, for the treatment or the pre-treatment of our bio oil. So this is the stuff we in, uh, work which are going on with the IFM. So these are the quite simple steps with the plant extract, you mix it with some zinc oxide, you have your nanoparticle, you see the pickups absorption to be sure the nanoparticle are there. And then you proceed with analyzing your nanoparticle in order to see the size, the proper size you would like to use. And then the next step is to proceed with the pretreatment of your biomass. So this is uh, quite um, what uh, as a whole I would, uh, I would like to say. The IFM really, it's a, it's a useful tool and quite easy to be in working with it when you are working in the field of biomolecule, biomolecule or nano devices in order to detect some molecule. 
but you could also play with it in a different sector. Like for example, we now we are working in bioenergy in order to have a better understanding before to to um, proceed with uh, the synthesis or the, the fabrication of the biofuel. In order to have a better biofuel, we use the, the IFM to select the proper nano, nanoparticles. I think this is all for me. And uh, I would like to thank my, past, my uh, Italy uh, uh, colleague and my communist colleague also, which are working for me, with me. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Maurice, for a, a very interesting talk. Uh, I'll go straight to questions. So if anyone has any questions, uh, do let me know in the chat or raise your hand. Uh, and I'll be able to give you the word. If, if not, I can start because I'm in solid state and I use AFMs quite often. So okay. I, was, uh, I was quite curious. I, in one of your slides, I think that right at the end of the first half, you yeah. you mentioned that you could use. So you're studying, as far as I understand, the um, single strand DNA. Um, yeah physical properties, chemical, uh, how it um, mechanical. And um, right at the very end, you had something said that you could detect a mismatch in terms of yes. basis. So I was just wondering in, in, in the big scale of things, uh, uh, um, of course, this is done in a lab, but when we think in terms of a biosensor, could this be used to detect um, gene genetic diseases or, or any sort of genetic alteration? Um, I've just, if you had any comment on that, uh, I'd be interested in knowing how this would potentially scale. Yeah, please, uh, please. In fact, we, we test it just not only in the lab. We, we work also with um, people uh, at, so we combine it with ele an electrochemical detection approach in order to see if our techniques were consistent. We work also in collaboration with this clinical uh, um, laboratory. They were they gave us some uh, sample in order to see if we could go to genetic, and it was quite consistent. Also, I could share with you the paper. So it could go definitely to large scale and uh, real case for sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Everyone's being shy. Uh, <laughs> few people are thanking you for the a very good talk in the chat. <laughs> Thank you, Asma. Um, if not, I'll keep going. I have quite a few. Um, I'd be... Um, in terms of uh, other, I'm, I've always been curious because I, I did a little bit of um, quantum effects in biology uh, during my master's. Um, so I'd just be interested, of course, here you're studying DNA uh, um, samples. Are there any other particular biological systems this could be used on or you'd be thought about or, or looked into um, other than just, uh, well, yeah. Yeah, the, the one we are interesting is the one uh, we could like a functionalization of protein, uh, like functionalized with DNA, of course, again. So it, because those those uh, uh, nanospot could help us to see also, because if, for example, you would like to see the concentration of any kind of protein, for example, linked to tumor and so on, you could functionalize the protein directly. For example, you could do the PCR with, with uh, uh, the Eliza, 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 I think, I don't know if you know Eliza, um, biotech, biotech, Eliza, uh, no, okay. When you would like to detect like an uh, antibody and uh, uh, like uh, so you could use the same system in the same sense that you functionalize your DNA with a protein and then you do the incubation with an antibody to see if has, it has occurred, it has uh, interact 
and then you you will know that the antibody and the protein has interacted if you have this change of height so it's not just a dna you you could functionalize the dna with a, a protein in order to detect any kind of protein happening in the uh, at the surface so it's not just stopping at um, at the stage of the dna but from what me for the moment i'm interesting is uh, on working on the p uh, let me show you this protein of uh, linked to the malaria disease for example okay. so this protein they call it pfum1 and this one I, i'm really interesting on seeing the interaction between this uh, protein as you could see here and the anti anti antibody here you see because here for sure they are playing mechanical property uh, to see how it uh, could bind or how it could break and so on In, from my point of view we could do the reverse also and try to see to do some force curve study and see the breakage point so we could do alternatively so this is something i'm really interested on studying this kind of protein okay thank you um any other questions? Uh, yes, hello, Maurice. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, so I was wondering if the if the work you do is interdisciplinary. So if there are chemistry working with physicists and biologists as well, and I was wondering how that works between um, all of you. Okay. So as a background, I'm a physicist, but during my PhD, I become, I don't know now, I'll become a biologist or, or chemist, I don't know. But the, 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 the thing I found that very interesting with, while doing my PhD is that the, you need to work with the multidisciplinary people in order to have more idea. Because us physicists, we just stop in our world and that's all, we know everything. But I think we need to cross by, uh, and try to learn from other in order to have more idea and go outside of the box, I think. This is uh, what I found out. Because uh, just to say short, uh, here in Congo, it's, it's really difficult for a physicist working with a biologist because uh, they all are in their world. But uh, you just explain it, but I need to understand your DNA. I don't have any idea. And he also, he said, me, I will explain to you, it's simply a polymer. I could give you some uh, equation of polymer in order to describe the conformation. And then it's click, and then um, things happen. So multidisciplinary, it's, uh, it's necessary. It's really important when you're doing research, for sure. Thank you so much. I was asking because I'm actually quite interested in, in following um, a physicist and the biology path in the future. So that was why I was asking. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for your talk as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, historically, the, the physics department at Porto has a very strong medical physics degree. Uh, well, at the uh, master's level. Okay, uh, okay thank you. Uh, uh any other questions last chance <laughs> if not i think we we can close here uh Thank you. people are well clearly enjoyed your, your 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 presentation as you can see from the chat and uh once again I'd like to thank you for having accepted our invitation and being here today. Um, I personally, I really enjoyed your talk. I, I think uh, many more people also did. And um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you. Thank you.